Okay, um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I am pleased, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Tomer Schenner, who is one of my astronomer friends since many years ago. Um, so uh, Tomer is from Israel. He actually studied his uh, bachelor, he got his bachelor's degree in Technion, Israel. Is that pronounced correctly? Technion? Yeah, kind of. Uh, he, then he moved to Berlin to work, actually to Potsdam, to work with uh, Wolfgang and Hammond. Uh, he actually studied his uh, master and he got his, also his PhD degree in astrophysics, working on um, massive stars, in particular, and stellar spectra from binary systems and rotation from Wolfram stars. Um, since two years ago, he's, uh, he's a postdoc at the KU Lippin as part of an ERC fund grant. He's also he's still working on massive stars and binary systems and uh, progenitors of this, the new generation of physics in, in gravitational waves. So he's gonna talk uh, about uh, stellar black holes. So I'll wait, let, let him do it, thanks. Thank you very much, Jesus. I'm very happy to be there or here kind of. Uh, it's a shame we cannot meet in person, but it's still something. I guess it makes it easier to travel to Mexico. Uh, so, um, first of all, yeah, the talk is kind of going to be about black hole. You're, you'll see that it will slide and go to stars of lower and lower masses as we advance, um, and you'll see why. I want to highlight the fact that I, I did design this talk so that it's supposed to be understandable to most astrophysicists. So if you feel like you cannot follow and have questions along the way, uh, as far as I'm concerned, feel, please feel free to interrupt. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, research that we've been doing in the context of uh, the hunt for black, galactic black holes. And the talk actually starts with, uh, or will be centered around uh, this guy here who is called LB1. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about this system, but it got famous uh, uh, late last year when Leo et al. published uh, in Nature that this is a binary system right in our own galaxy that contains a black hole that weighs about 70 solar masses. Now, as Jesus said, we're only talking today about uh, stellar mass black holes. And for a stellar mass black hole, this is a gigantic uh, mass. And indeed, the media got all very excited about it. And uh, we immediately heard about an impossibly massive black hole that was discovered right in our own galaxy. And uh, rightly so. You'll soon see why this discovery was really uh, quite shocking for a uh, stellar astrophysicist. Uh, there was another much more recent discovery uh, or a report of another black hole, this time in a system called HR6819, uh, which was claimed to be a triple system containing a black hole this time it's not claimed to be as massive, but because of the proximity of the system to the uh, sun, it got the title of being the closest black hole to the sun. And so the media again got very excited, reporting of the closest black hole uh, ever found to uh, the sun. So I'll get back to these two systems later. But why do we keep hearing about black holes so much all of a sudden? Uh, well, uh, you probably know that uh, in the last few years we have been detecting more and more of these gravitational waves that are coming to us from the very distant uh, rims of the universe, uh, where uh, binaries of sub such compact objects, such as neutron stars or black holes, merge. How they form is a whole uh, new uh, research subject. But by utilizing these uh, gravitational wave signals, we can actually, for the first time, measure masses of compact objects by direct means. And one of the important uh, uh, impacts of, of this research is actually such a diagram so in case you've never seen these diagrams before, basically on the y-axis you see the mass, uh, the x-axis has absolutely no meaning, and the individual points depict the masses of, uh, the measure, measured masses of compact objects. Now before we had gravitational waves, the only way we could measure masses was by means of uh, X-ray binaries. So binaries where a compact object accretes mass from a nearby star and emits an X-rays. What gravitational waves did is to populate this upper part of this diagram where you can see basically every time emerging events so two black holes merging and uh, becoming a more massive uh, black hole merger. And one could hold a seminar just staring at this diagram. There is a lot of science here, but the only take home message I actually want you to take from this diagram is that there are no 
stellar black hole masses uh, that were uh, reported that exceed the limit of about 50 solar masses. So you might uh, wonder why I'm saying that, because you do see a few black holes above this limit, but you'll note that these black holes are always the merger product. And we'll soon see why uh, this is thought to be the case. Okay, so I, this was an update I introduced a few minutes before uh, coming here. Late, uh, yesterday, there was a discovery of the most massive black hole merger ever reported uh, with masses of 81 and 65 solar masses. So it kind of contradicts everything I just told you. Uh, we still need to see whether it uh, passes the test of time, uh, but uh, it is indeed very challenging. So the astronomers are now trying to figure out how that can be, and you'll soon see why it uh, is a problem for us. But let's for now stick to this 50 solar mass limit, which seem to have been consistent with all previous observations. So to understand why a 70 solar mass black hole in our own galaxy is so surprising, we need to take one step back and actually remind ourselves where these black holes come from. And we know that they come from massive stars. So these are stars that are initially more massive than about eight times the mass of the sun. Um, this is how massive stars are defined. And we define it like, uh, them like this because these are the sort of stars that would end up developing an iron core. And as you probably know, when stars develop an iron core, they can no longer fuse uh, iron to, uh, to uh, support uh, the gravitational pull and they will end up uh, undergoing core collapse, becoming either neutron stars or black holes. So some important properties of massive stars, first of all, they're very rare because the initial mass function favors the formation of uh, uh, low mass stars like our sun. And their motto is that they live fast and die young, which makes them even rarer. So stars like our sun evolve over the scale of billions of years, but massive stars evolve over the scale of millions of years. So they are not only rarely produced, they're also, they have a very short lifetime. But they make up for this by being extremely luminous. So one massive star can outshine a million suns in terms of the energy it produces every second. And they also tend to be very hot throughout uh, most of their lives. And together, this means that they have a gigantic impact on their environment uh, as they evolve. Another important quality of massive stars is that they have um, powerful, stellar winds. So stellar winds is basically a constant outflow of matter from the surface of the star to their environment. And in the case of massive stars, these winds are typically understood to be radiatively driven, meaning that, meaning that the light that they emit gets absorbed in their outer layers and pushes the matter away from them. And lastly, the majority of massive stars are uh, thought to end their lives as core collapse supernovae, which belong to some of the most powerful explosions we know. And so if you want to discuss the evolution of a star, usually you would want to resort to this diagram here. If you're not a stellar astrophysicist, this is a hellsprung russell diagram where you plot the luminosity and the temperature of a star. And here you see an example of such an evolution track calculated for a 15 solar mass star. And like all stars, it would spend most of its time burning hydrogen on the main sequence until after about 90% of its lifetime has gone away and it would leave the main sequence would very rapidly expand to the red supergiant phase where it burns helium in its core. And eventually uh, the fate of a red supergiant, for example, like Betelgeuse uh, that we can see in the sky uh, is to explode as a hydrogen rich supernova leaving behind a neutron star. But something quite different happens as you go up the mass scale and you go to more massive stars. So for example, okay, this is loud. For example, a 30 solar mass star in our own galaxy would probably not end its life as a red supergiant, but rather go all the way here to the, the regime of very high effective temperatures. The reason it does that is because the more massive a star is, the stronger the mass loss it supports because of its stellar wind. So it can actually strip itself off its outer layers and uh, become a compact hydrogen depleted hot star. And we see stars that look like that. They're called classical Wolfreya stars. And they have exactly these properties, and they are thought to be the descendants of these very massive stars prior to the uh, core collapse into black holes. So before we return to black holes, I just want to highlight the fact that massive stars um, are a very important agent in the uh, chemical and energetic evolution of galaxies. So through their stellar winds and supernovae and hard radi radiation, they completely dominate the stellar feedback of stellar populations. They drive the chemical evolution uh, of the universe. And they, of course, enable the study of extreme physics through all these phenomena 
and you can see all these gorgeous uh, pictures basically, which are uh, uh, basically made by the massive stellar content uh, within them. But if, you want, if we want to understand how massive black holes can actually get, the obvious question to ask ourselves first is how massive can stars get? What is the upper mass limit of stars? And the obvious way to answer that is to try and find the most massive stars out there. And we'll get back to that later. You may know that uh, stellar astrophysicists like to measure masses with binaries, just like the Earth moves around the sun. We can utilize the motion of the star to uh, measure uh, its mass. And people have been doing that in our own galaxy. And the record-breaking stars uh, seem to have masses of about 120 solar masses. So these are the most massive uh, confirmed masses of the most massive stars uh, in our own galaxy. Even more massive stars were reported in the nearby galaxy of the Large Magellanic Cloud, masses of about 140 or 150 solar masses. And I would consider this as the robust upper mass limit. So uh, we know that stars reaching about these masses exist out there. But there are even more massive stars that have been reported to exist. Right in the Tarantula Nebula, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, there is a core, as Sorry, there is a cluster called uh, R136, a very dense cluster. And uh, Paul Crowther and collaborators were actually able to dissect this cluster and resolve it to individual uh, components, which you can see here, especially A1 and A2, which are extremely luminous uh, sources. And if you just look at the luminosity of these point sources, you can estimate masses of the order of 300 solar masses. The problem is here is that we don't know whether or not these sources are really single stars or whether they're multiple uh, stars, for example, binaries or even triple systems. And this is something we're currently collecting more data on with HST in hope to be able to resolve or to find out about the multiplicity of these uh, objects. So 300 solar masses is possible, but it's not as robust as 150 solar masses. Okay, so what's my point? Why am I telling you all of this? Because I want you to, to wonder if um, stars as massive as 150 solar mass star exist, why is it so surprising to see a 70 solar mass uh, black hole in our own galaxy? And why does it get published in nature? The obvious answer to people who have experience with stars is that stars lose mass throughout their lives. And you see here a real video of the only star uh, of which we can actually uh, resolve uh, it's outflow in live motion, and this is the sun. So even the sun loses mass through its solar outflow. But we can ask ourselves how much mass does it actually lose? And so I prepared this uh, low-tech uh, table here where I compare the uh, mass loss uh, from a star like our sun with the mass loss of more massive stars, so 20 and 200 solar masses. So the sun, for example, uh, would evolve over the scale of about 10 to the 10 years, 10 billion years. Currently, it loses a mass at a rate of about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year. This is the unit we like to use. So you multiply these two numbers, and you get that if the sun would continue losing mass at its current rate, it would have lost about 10 to the minus 4 solar masses throughout its life. It doesn't have to remain constant, of course, the mass loss, but this gives you a feeling to what the current mass loss of the sun does, and it's not a lot, right? The sun wouldn't really care about such a mass being lost. But if you do the same experiment for a 20 or even 200 solar mass star, even though they live a much shorter life, about a million years, their mass loss rates are about 10 orders of magnitudes larger. And this means that the stars basically evaporate themselves through their stellar winds. Of course, it, they don't really evaporate themselves and you cannot crunch in stellar evolution in a few table, uh, columns of a table, but it just comes to show the important effect of mass loss on massive stars. And you can see that visually, by looking at an evolution track of 120 solar mass star in our own galaxy, especially looking at the bottom diagram where you see the evolution of the mass, you see that the star starts its life uh, with 120 solar masses, but as the star evolves, already on the main sequence, it loses a substantial amount of mass, and then it reaches the wolf rayet phase where it really loses a huge amount of mass within a very short period of time, and at the fate of a 120 solar mass star in our own galaxy is to end its life with about 10 solar masses. So the black hole that it would produce would have a comparable mass. And this shows you why it's so difficult to get a 70 solar mass black hole in our own galaxy. Now, this is directly confirmed by observations of classical Wolf-Rayet stars. Remember, these are the 
descendants of these very massive stars. And we sometimes observe them in binaries so we can actually measure their masses. And if you would measure the masses of all Freya stars, you would typically get masses of the order of 10 to 20 solar masses. So nothing like the original 100, 120, 150 solar masses they might uh, have been. Um, yeah. Is there a question or? Sorry, can I ask some stuff for me? Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, I was, I was just wondering, I mean, this is just the winds, right? They are like uh, um, making the star uh, smaller, but what about if it's a uh, biomass? If it's what? Gaining mass, I mean. Mm. Do you keep... So, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So you you're asking. Okay. So you say stars lose mass through winds, but can they also gain mass? For example, through binary interaction. You mean? Sorry. The thing is that my connection is like really bad. So I, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Uh, we can discuss this later. Uh, right. Okay. So. Stars lose mass, they can also gain mass by creative processes, but that's something we can discuss uh, later. So in principle, it's, it's not easy, let's put it like this, it's not easy to understand how a 120 solar mass star avoids this mass loss and how you can actually produce such a uh, massive black hole. You need to start with very exotic scenarios. Okay, but then one may wonder how come LIGO or the gravitational wave detectors are observing black holes of, in the excess of about 40 solar masses. Uh, if stars in our own galaxy, uh, their fate is to end their lives with about 10 solar masses. And it became quite immediately clear that this is related to the metallicity. So we know that, that um, so first of all, if you, you're not familiar with the term, metallicity means the uh, content of elements heavier than helium. And we know that these gravitational wave events uh, come to us from the very distant universe where massive stars didn't yet have time to enrich their environment with metals. This means that they uh, form in low metallicity environments. And what it means for massive stars is that their layers become less opaque. They cannot absorb light as efficiently. Metallicity is a very important contributor to the opacity in stars. And remember that light is the thing that is driving the winds. So if you reduce the opacity, it means that you get weaker winds, and with weaker winds, you get less mass loss. And this means that star at low metallicity environment can retrain more of its mass. And you can see that again uh, as an example here, where on the right-hand side, you see the evolution of 120 solar mass star, just like before, but for a low metallicity environment, uh, such as the small Magellanic Cloud. And you see that the star still loses a significant amount of mass, but uh, less mass. So it would actually end its life with, of course, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties here, but uh, with this current set of models uh, calculated, it would be passed with about 40 uh, solar masses. Okay, so maybe we can use the metallicity argument to explain a 70 solar mass black hole in our galaxy. Uh, one may be able to think that. Uh, so it's not easy, of course, to ex understand why such a very massive star should form not too far away from the sun at very low metallicity. But it turns out that there is an even more uh, fundamental problem, and it's related to an entirely different uh, uh, issue, which is called parent stability supernova. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it deserves one slide. Um, so basically, supernova research tells us that stars, even if they manage to finish their lives with a mass of about 60 solar masses, if they somehow survive all this mass loss and manage to retrain this mass, they're expected to undergo a type of explosion called parent stability supernova. And the a, a special property of the supernova is that they don't leave anything behind. The entire star becomes a gigantic explosion and no black hole is formed. And detailed calculations actually predict that this limit should be at about 50 solar masses. So until yesterday, this was the explanation, the main explanation for why we don't observe black holes that are more massive than about 50 solar masses. Yesterday kind of changes that, but I'm not going to talk about this uh, right now. We can speculate this later if you're interested. Um, so I will say that there have been, a, after LB1, this uh, 70 solar mass black hole, uh, thing was published in Nature, there was a series of papers both discussing why this is unlikely 
uh, kind of on the basis of what I showed you, but also suggesting alternative models of how we could maybe form a 70 solar mass black hole. And it's all very interesting, uh, but in Leuven, of course, as observers or people working with data, we were interested in actually seeing what the 70 solar mass black hole measurement actually relies on and whether we can trust it, even though it's published in nature. So LB1 is a star about 2.1 uh, kiloparsec away from the sun. It's neither too bright nor, nor too faint, and nobody really cared about it until it was published to be the 70 solar mass black hole. And in fact, Liu et al. claimed that it's a binary comprising of a B-type star that, uh, for those of you who are not stellar astrophysicists, it's something like that seems like an eight solar mass star, at least naively, uh, going uh, in an orbit of about 80 days around a 70 solar mass black hole in a nearly circular orbit. And this black hole apparently has a disk around it. So they, this was the basic claim by Liu et al. So what was this claim based on? Well, like I mentioned before, masses in stellar astrophysics usually come from binary motion and LB1 is not different. So in a binary, you would have two th stars that are moving around one another, just like the earth and the sun. And if I would take a spectrum um, or multiple spectra of such a system, as the stars go around one another, I would see the spectral features of the stars moving back and forth in antiphase. And so these are real data taken for LB1, taken for the system, uh, taken with our uh, home telescope basically at K. Leuven for which we have access to with the Hermi spectrograph. And these are quite noisy spectra and I realize some of you are probably not spectroscopists. Uh, you don't have to understand much here except of the fact that there is something, uh, some spectral feature, this in this case belonging to a helium one line, that is moving back and forth and you can measure the velocities associated with this. And if you do that you get this red point that you see here. And this red point traces a radial velocity curve. So there is a star here moving around something at a period of about 78, nine days. Now, if you look at the spectrum of the star, naively it looks, you know, based on the temperature and the ionization species, it looks like a star that would typically have a mass of about six, seven, eight solar masses. But the problem is you don't see a companion. You don't see what's causing it to shake, at least not naively, just by looking at the spectrum. But you do, something, you do see something else which is very unique. So this is the H alpha line. It's a line belonging to hydrogen. And it's a line that is very susceptible to outflow. Now, usually if it's a normal star, you would just expect to see absorption here, moving back and forth, just like you see this line here. Instead, you see this crazy emission that seems to have a life of its own. It doesn't trace the same motion as this line. And uh, for a spectroscopist, this emission is reminiscent of a disk. So it looks like there's a disk in the system. The authors of the Nature paper noted uh, that the wings of this uh, line, which I I'm trying to zoom in on here, actually show an ever so slightly antiphase motion to the absorption. So if you look at it carefully, you would see that every time the absorption line moves to the right, the emission, the emission moves a little to the left. And they suggested therefore that there is a disk here moving in antiphase to the absorption line star. And therefore it must be around the companion of the absorption line star. Now you can calculate the velocities associated with these motions, and that's what they did. And you can see the rapidly moving star here, and which I'll call from now on the primary or the B-type primary. And you can see the disk measurements here. Now from the ratio of the velocity amplitudes, you can immediately get the ratio of the masses of the two objects. And based on the measurements that the authors had, they said, well, the mass of this slowly moving moving object is about 8.5 times the mass of the rapidly moving B-type star. And then they, well, they looked at the spectrum. They had a preliminary model for the spectrum. And you'll see uh, soon that it was wrongly uh, associated with an eight solar mass star. So if you plug in an eight, eight solar masses in this uh, MB here, you get that the mass of the unseen companion is about 70 solar masses. And if it were a star, we, it would completely outshine everything else in the system. And since we don't see any star here, the conclusion was that it's a black hole. So this was the, this was the line of argumentation of the Nature paper. What are the problems? So there are two problems here, actually. Uh, the first one is related to the interpretation of the motion of these emission features. And to illustrate this, I just want to guide you through some kind of a thought experiment. So recall that in the H alpha line, in this line where we see emission, 
we actually expect the star to show, the, the star that we do see, this B-type star, to show absorption. And this absorption will be moving back and forth uh, like all the other lines of the star. Now, imagine that for some reason we have an emission here that doesn't move at all. It doesn't matter now why. Maybe there's a nebula around the star, maybe uh, a circumbinary disk. Um, it's just a thought experiment. If we were to observe such a configuration and take multiple spectra of such a configuration, you would see these kind of blue simulated spectra. And if you look at the wings of the spectra, it looks like the emission is moving in antiphase. You will see that every time the absorption is on the right, the emission is on the left and vice versa. But you know that nothing is moving here because this is a simulation. So what happens here is actually that the absorption, moving absorption causes this illusion of a moving emission. And this idea was uh, a very important idea that uh, my colleague, Michael abdul Masi first came up with. We were all sitting together in the seminar room when it, where he suggested that, and we immediately simulated this and uh, we saw that it's an important effect and sub submitted this back to nature. Uh, it was basically on the same day independently uploaded to archive by uh, an independent group. What it actually means is that you cannot trust the mass measurement or the mass ratio that I showed you before. We don't know what the mass ratio of the two components is. The second problem is the eight solar mass assumption. So both our spectral analysis as well as spectral analysis provided by independent groups all provided consistently uh, a, a peculiarly low, low mass for uh, this apparently eight solar mass star. In fact, a mass that looks more like one or two solar masses. So a mass comparable with our own sun's mass. In fact, Ilgang et al noted that Together with this very low mass and the weird abundances that the primary seems to have, it doesn't look like a normal star at all. It looks like a star that lost its outer layers, something we call a stripped star, and I'll get back to that later. So it became more and more clear that this originally eight solar mass star is in fact a one to two solar mass stripped star. And if we think about the assumptions for the 70 solar mass black hole, we now know that we can neither trust this equation here, telling us the ratio, nor can we trust the mass, uh, adopted mass for the B-type star. And so we see that there is actually no basis for the 70 star mass black hole in the system. And I could end the talk here, but of course, we want to know what is going on in the system. And it was, in fact, still speculated that it might be a black hole, but maybe of a lower mass. So to advance here, what we did is uh, uh, implemented a technique called spectral disentangling. Uh, what spectral disentangling does is you take a bunch of phase dependent spectra, like you see here, you plug them into some kind of a mathematical algorithm. There are different ways of doing that. And what you get out are two spectra in the case of a binary, each spectrum corresponding to uh, uh, the, one component in the system. So one of the big advantages of doing that is that you strongly boost the signal to noise. So the signal to noise of, of your uh, disentangled spectra is significantly larger than the individual's observations. It's kind of like adding them up in a smart way. Now to do this, you need the orbital parameters. So like the period, the eccentricity, uh, radio velocity, amplitudes, and so on. But you can imagine that you can do this process iteratively. For example, if I adopt a really bad period in this procedure, I would get spectra that don't make much sense. And we can measure that, um, how well they reproduce the observations through some chi-square, for example. So by repeating this iteratively, you can also derive, uh, or at least, uh, yeah, derive partly uh, some of the orbital parameters. And so this is a method that we implemented on LB1. We actually know all the orbital parameters. We know the period, we know the eccentricity, we know how fast the, the stripped star or this B-type star is moving. The only thing we don't know is how rapidly the object with the disk is moving, or more generally, the secondary. Now, you don't need to assume anything here, except that there is something moving in antiphase. That's the only thing, the only assumption that enters. And we tried two uh, independent methods here, uh, one relying on Fourier space and one relying on wavelength space, which is called shift and add. And both these methods yielded very consistent results. What we found is that the data are best explained if you assume that the secondary, the thing that has a disk around it, moves with a radial velocity amplitude of about 11 kilometer per second. Okay, so that's not too exciting. It's just a measurement. But what do you actually get out if you plug this in the code? You, so you get two spectra out. And I can imagine that not everyone are excited when they see spectra, but I, as a spectroscopist, I do have to spend a little time on this data. 
So <clears throat> we got two spectra out, each of them belonging to a co uh, companion in this uh, binary. The first one was not such a big uh, surprise. It's the star we've been seeing all along. It's a star with very narrow spectral lines, implying that it's a very slow rotator. It is helium rich. You can clearly see that it has very strong helium lines. If you analyze it spectroscopically, you find that it has a low gravity, which is indeed consistent with a low mass of about one to two solar masses. It is nitrogen rich, which is also not a typical thing for a normal star. And it also has these funny emission features in Balmer lines, which are, have, we have like four different models for that, but our favorite one is that uh, this star actually has a small disk around it. Not the disk we've been seeing all along, but another disk. So we, we can discuss this if uh, that interests you. But the bigger surprise here actually as an output of this disentangling is that the second star, well, we knew that it has disks uh, that there is a disk here. Uh, and these are the disk features that we've been seeing all along. But what we saw also is that it's actually a star. You can see very clearly the presence of spectral lines. Uh, you can also see it in the upper panel. And this means that it's not a black hole. It's not a neutron star. It's a normal star, only that the star has a disk around it and it's a very rapid rotator, which is why it has these very broad lines. So if you're bored by staring at the spectra, this is the equivalent image. This is our suggestion what LB1 actually is. It's not, it does, it's not a binary containing a black hole, but rather it contains a B-type star, a very rapidly rotating B-type star that has a disk around it. And these stars have a name, they're called BE stars. So about 20% of the B-type stars are these BE stars. And we found that in LB1, there's simply a BE star that was hiding there all along and was not seen simply because of its uh, broad spectral lines. So we estimate a mass of about seven solar masses for this star, and it basically rotates at, at near its critical velocity, meaning that it cannot rotate any more rapidly without disrupting. And its companion is the star we've been seeing all along. It's actually a stripped star, a star that lost its outer envelope. It is of lower mass. It, uh, we estimate a mass of about 1.5 solar masses, and it's a very slow rotator. And like I mentioned, we think that it indeed has a small disk around it as well. So how does such a system uh, form? Well, we know that the majority of massive stars spend their lives in binary systems. And in a binary system, the evolution of a star can be quite different than uh, as a single star. So you know that as massive stars or generally as stars evolve, they tend to expand. And in a binary, uh, the more massive star would expand more rapidly. And it cannot simply just expand arbitrarily. If it has a companion near it, eventually this companion is going to block its way. And this is where Roche lobe overflow would occur. And so at this point, copious amount of mass are actually being transferred from the original primary to the secondary. Mass inversion happens. The primary loses a lot of its hydrogen rich outer layers. The secondary becomes a very rapid rotator. Um, and at this point, you would actually see a very rapidly rotating star that potentially has a disk around it and a stripped star. And we think that LB1 represents exactly this phase, a very rare phase shortly after mass transfer. So we see the presence of a BE star, the star with a disk, and we see the stripped star next to it. The, the reason we think it's a rare phase is because the stripped star seems to be on its way of becoming a helium burning object. So it's an evolved star, but it has not yet settled as a helium burning object. It still seems to be thermally contracting. This was also suggested by Irgang et al. And we can confirm this. And so uh, we think that LB1 is really this rare evolutionary phase post mass transfer. If I would fast forward the evolution of LB1 a few tens of thousands of years in the future, we expect it to become a BE binary hosting and O sub dwarf as companion. If you're not familiar with these objects, these are helium burning, hot, compact, script objects that are well known and it's a whole re uh, field of research how they form. And we do know of such binaries. We know, for example, of the binary Phi Persei and Omi Poop, which are exactly these kind of BE plus O sub dwarf binaries. The special thing about LB1 is that the mass of the stripped star seems to be quite high. In fact, it's the largest mass ever reported for such uh, an object. And it could exceed the Chandrasekhar uh, limit. If it does, it means that it's a supernova progenitor, meaning that the star may end up uh, forming a supernova, leaving behind a neutron star. Uh, this system could then become a BE X-ray binary. 
uh, the two objects could merge, they could produce a thorn Zitko object, and maybe by some lack, lucky chance, you'd get another supernova and uh, you'd get a, a double neutron star binary. So there are, there are a lot of uh, different uh, formation channels we can imagine uh, for the future of uh, LB1. So this kind of concludes our model for LB1. Uh, now you may remember that I started the talk by also mentioning another black hole, uh, this time in a triple system. And you may hope that I won't touch that black hole, but uh, of course we had to throw our tools also on this uh, system here. And I'm afraid to say that we found uh, shockingly similar uh, results actually. So uh, I'll be more quick about this one. Uh, this time we're talking about a much brighter star. It's about 350 parsec away from us, so much closer to us than LB1. It is very bright. It's visible to the naked eye and Therefore, it's been well studied in the past, and it's been a known binary for decades now, uh, with a period of about 40 days. And you can see different spectral types in the literature, but again, nobody really cared about it too much until uh, very recently, a few months ago, uh, there was an ESO press release led by Revinius et al, claiming that this is a triple system um, with a BE star as a tertiary, and going around a binary that comprises a B giant, so basically an evolved five solar mass star, and a black hole. So now you're all spectroscopy experts, and I don't need to explain to you how they got to this conclusion. Basically, these are real data uh, taken with the ferro spectrograph for uh, this system. You can again see the presence of a star moving back and forth with a period of 40.3 days. But because the data are of such high quality, you can immediately spot the presence of another star here. You see this very rapid, uh, sorry, very broad uh, absorption, which now you know implies that a rapid rotator is here. You can also see uh, the presence of the star in other lines because of the high signal to noise. For example, these emission, iron two emission lines, which are very typical for uh, BE stars. And you can also see it, of course, in the infamous uh, hydrogen lines, for example, in H alpha. So it's clear that there is a star here, something that looks like naively, like a five solar mass star moving back and forth. And it's clear that there is a BE star here. Now the obvious question is, are they not bound? Are they not simply a binary? Um, Revinius said, I'll claim that they're not simply because uh, they looked at the data and they said, well, it doesn't seem like this BE star is moving. If it were a binary, the BE star would have to move in antiphase. And so this is why they came up with this kind, quite, kind of com cumbersome scenario where you have a tertiary BE star that is hardly moving, going around an inner binary. And based on dynamical arguments, you see how rapidly the star is moving and the estimated mass of the star, they concluded that the companion must be a black hole of about four solar masses, or at least four solar masses, because otherwise uh, we would have seen a star uh, with this mass. So. There was a paper by Safarsa de Tunen and Loeb actually pointing out that this is a very unlikely scenario just based on the statistical, uh, uh, statistical argumentations. And there was also an interesting paper by Mazen Feigler actually uh, showing that the black hole is not the only resolution. And you, you could also, for example, invoke uh, quadruple, so a binary instead of this black hole. And these are interesting models, but of course for us, the obvious question was, can we really know that the B star is static? Or can it simply be that it's hardly moving, that it's moving very slowly, kind of like the sun moving around the center of mass? And so we assume that it does participate in the 40-day orbit. And we did exactly the same sort of analysis. We disentangled the spectra as a function of its radial velocity amplitude. And if we would find that the data are consistent with an amplitude of zero, this would support the triple configuration. But if we find that the data are better explained with a positive amplitude, implying that the B star is moving in antiphase, this would strongly support the fact that the two stars are actually bound and you don't need any black holes in here. And without going into the details of the analysis, at least these curves may look familiar. I showed you a similar one before. You basically see chi-square, so how well uh, the disentangled spectra reproduce the observations based on which amplitude you assume. And no matter on which line we looked, we always found a positive amplitude, typically of the order of four kilometers per second. So we had like 20 different lines that we analyzed and the weighted mean indeed yielded uh, four kilometers per second. And we performed a lot of simulations to convince ourselves that these are real uh, measurements. And so we find that the B star is very slowly moving around the center of mass of these two uh, uh, stars. 
Now, the, this time the results were uh, uh, published in a publication led by my colleague, Julia Bodensteiner. Our model is very, very similar. We find that again, the B-type star is not a regular evolved five solar mass star, but it's a stripped star. It's a 0 0.5 solar mass star, so a very low mass star. Um, this is to me was also an eye opener. I hadn't realized that, st that stars of these masses can look like that. And these results were confirmed by independent studies since uh, doing their own independent analysis. And to summarize, we basically see that we had these two systems with these exciting black holes claimed in them. What we actually find is that these two systems are not, do not contain black holes, but are rather uh, rare phases of BE binaries. There are some differences between the systems, uh, many similarities. Uh, probably the biggest difference is the mass of the strip star in LB1, which is a, estimated to be about 1.5 solar masses, whereas in HR6819, it's estimated to be uh, much lower. And the mass ratio here is much more extreme. There are some additional differences. For example, the strip star here is a pulsator. Here, it's not a pulsator. Uh, so it's a lot of interesting physics uh, that uh, if you're interested, we can uh, discuss. I would like to finish up by putting these uh, discoveries in the context of uh, the broader context of astrophysics. Um, first of all, just touching upon the context of BE stars. So where do these BE stars come from? Uh, I mentioned before that about 20% of the B-type stars are seen to be rapid rotators with disks. And it's been uh, an idea for a few decades now that actually binary interactions explain the formation of these BE stars. But this is just one explanation out of about four possible explanations. And it's still an ongoing debate whether some BE stars form from binary interaction, do all of them form from binary interaction. So together with Julia Bodenstein, we actually just published a paper on, uh, on this question where we actually looked at a sample of BE stars and found that wherever you look, you never find that they have main sequence companions. They always seem to be either single or they have funny stripped star companion or neutron star companions next to them, which I think suggests very strongly that indeed BE stars originate uh, almost predominantly from binaries. And I think finding systems like LB1 and HR6819, which represent this rare evolutionary phase of a BE binary, gives us further evidence that this channel is a very common channel. Because if we observe rare phases of something, that it must mean that this channel is common. There's also the question of stripped stars. And that's a whole uh, another uh, research, uh, ma matter of research. Um, the, the stripped stars are, are expected to be very abundant uh, in the universe. And especially these massive stripped stars, stars that exceed the Chandrasekhar limit, are the favored uh, progenitors for stripped supernovae, so hydrogen-poor supernovae. They are also suggested recently to be a very important ionizing source uh, in the universe. The only problem is that we've never really observed these stars by direct means. So they're expected to, they're expected to be hundreds of thousands of them in our own galaxy, but LB1 could potentially be the first detection of such a stripped star uh, that is in the mass regime between about two and eight uh, solar masses. So uh, I think that this uh, offers an interesting prospect uh, in this uh, respect. Um, usually I start my talks by saying that binary interaction dominates the evolution of massive stars, but uh, in this case, I brought it to the end. So all these binary uh, interaction scenarios that I showed you really makes our life difficult in terms of interpreting the population of massive stars. We know that they can merge, they can get stripped, they can accrete mass and it's only by studying these rare evolved phases that we can constrain the processes uh, that are involved in binary interactions. And so really by studying LB1 and HR6819, we can constrain processes like mass transfer, like uh, how, how big stars become and when do they transfer mass and so on. And finally, I promised you a talk about black holes and I ended up uh, debunking them all. So where are they? Uh, well, they do exist for sure. In fact, uh, very recent uh, predictions uh, uh, were published recently stating that about 2 to 4% of the massive stars should have black hole companions near them. And they should not look like X-ray binaries because the black holes are not actually accreting. And none of these systems have been discovered so far, and they, they're expected to be out there. And generally, the detections of black holes in our galaxy uh, are very, very, and uh, also in nearby galaxies are ve is very, very limited. And most of them are still under debate. 
So more should be out there and I hope that uh, uh, they will be found in coming years. So I would like to summarize, first of all, by saying that this has been really a collaborative effort with uh, many of my colleagues back at Leuven and we, who you see in front of you. Um, we have started by uh, showing you that the most massive stars ever reported seem to reach a limit of about 150 solar masses, potentially even larger, uh, and this uh, still needs to be seen, but that these stars in our own galaxy tend to end their lives as 10 solar mass Wolf-Rayet stars, which is why it's so surprising to find a 70 solar mass black hole right in our own galaxy. Um, I hope I could convince you that LB1, however, does not contain a black hole, but it's not less exciting. It's a, it represents a very rare evolutionary phase of, uh, of a massive binary. Uh, we suggest that the same model applies to this other system, HR6819. Um, I hope I could show you this has important implications for binary evolution in the uh, context of stripped stars and the origin of BE stars. And finally, I do believe that these black holes are out there and I hope that we can all go and find them, but we should just be careful about our biases in wanting to find them and uh, looking carefully at the data. So with this, I will end. Thank you very much. I don't know how long this has been. Five. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good. Um, okay, uh, let's see some raised hands for questions. I, I cannot raise my hand. Uh, but I okay, oh yeah, just, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this ratio estimation of for LB1 of eight, something like that. So you're saying that this is not valid for this specific system or this should not be valid for any binary system? You, you mean the, the, me, the measurement of the radial velocity amplitudes on the yes. basis of emission? Uh -huh. uh, the, the, the specific technique that they've been using by just naively looking at, um, at an emission line? Well, it's a complicated question, actually ironic, because I've been studying Wolf-Rayet binaries, you know, and they also have emission lines that move back and forth. And we do interpret this emission line moving back and forth as Doppler motion. Uh, it becomes problematic when the motion is comparable to the effect that you have of the absorption line star moving on top of this. So if, it, if it's an important effect, in this case it is, if you have absorption moving on top of the emission, uh, and if you can see that it's an important effect, then indeed you should be skeptical about the measurement that you get out and you should resort to other methods. For example, you could, you don't have to do this entangling. You could subtract the uh, contribution of the absorption line star and then try to do this measurement. Because the, so the, the ratio of masses of these curves is eight and your final masses more or less con are in agreement with this uh, yeah. ratio. Yeah. So what I think is that the ratio is not is not wrong, but the initial assumption that the one of the masses was eight that's the wrong assumption, right? So it looks like it in retrospect, but it's true that you're right that it, it turns out well. I think our mass ratio is more like five. Okay, so but it's it's really a lucky coincidence, and I can tell you that by having really studied the spectra carefully. It's it's uh, actually we didn't expect. We actually originally thought that the emission would be static and that nothing is moving here. Uh, the reason why there is this lucky coincidence that the measurement ended up not being so wrong is because the other star does not show absorption in H alpha, but also emission. And you can actually see that individual in the individual observations. And so it kind of canceled out the error. It's hard to explain, but it's kind of, it's really a lucky coincidence. So I would definitely say that this is not a valid uh, measurement. It's, it's, a, it's a coincidence that it turned out to be not too far off. And I have another question more like, uh, so yeah. you mentioned this torn sect of objects. Do you, do you believe in these objects that are, they will be observed? Um, because currently there's no like, significant evidence that these objects exist. You mean the stripped stars? The torn sect of objects. Ah, Thorne Zitko. Uh -huh. Well, well, 
so they're the looking through his eyes, but there's not um, clear observations that have demonstrated didn't you this. Didn't you find the thorn zitko object or no, something? No, no, no. Isn't it. that, didn't you claim that this one is a thorn no, no, zitko no, no, no. object? <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's going to be. I th I'm pretty sure you had a paper saying that this is a. Yeah. So we were trying to push this idea on Wolf 824, but we had, we do not believe so anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I I I don't know in terms of believing. I think that from the perspective of binary evolution, it's hard to avoid. I think it's expected that they're going to be there. The question is, how do you observe this? And uh, that's that's the point. I mean, what the the, obs the allegedly observed properties that these objects will have is that it will look like a red supergiant, but it will have like a bold star features like wolf red. So it, it's weird, something weird. Yeah, I know. I I think I don't know it very well, but Emily Levesque, I think, has a paper on. I mean, they they have their. I don't know if you have your opinion on that, but they have their favorite Thorn Zitko candidate. Uh, yeah, there's one or two or two candidates, but yeah. still candidates, not like completely demonstrated. Yeah, well, t t t how do you completely? Do you have to like, go, go into the core of the star and find a different star. I don't know how to do that. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, let's move on to Devaka, please. Hello, very nice talk, very nice talk. So first point, I would like to be sure, I mean, this claim of uh, this uh, 60, 70 solar mass black hole has been withdrawn because you convinced us that uh, mass is much less. I want to make sure that has been withdrawn right now. Well, uh, I'm not sure what the official procedure is and whether you withdraw, but I don't think you, to be honest, it's, it wasn't withdrawn, so it's still on. It's a Nature paper. Okay. Uh, our publication is also uh, our counter publication is also. So it, there was a series of papers. The first paper we published back on Nature. It's called Nature Matters Arising, which was also accepted to Nature, which basically shows that the uh, method of measurement is problematic. Then there is my paper where we actually show that there is a star in there, and that's just accepted in uh, ANA. Um, the paper itself was not withdrawn because I think it's not it's typically, you know, it's not like they had a uh, yeah. bug or an error. It's just, yeah. it's kind of how, how science works. So it's still out there, the paper. Okay. Uh, I have uh, another question, independent question. So in the final uh, minutes, you showed us the, the plots for the trip, the strip stars, sorry. The, the, the yes. The HR diagram for the strip stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, what is the expected luminosity for those stars? You, you had just shifted to the left. Uh, are yeah. they expected to be less luminous than the, the equivalent uh, main sequence stars? Okay, that's a good and complicated question. So I, I didn't mean to talk about this diagram. Uh, indeed, all the stars on the left, it's, it's a prediction uh, calculated by a colleague in uh, Bonn, University of Bonn, Chen Wang. Uh, specifically for the SMC, where you see a cloud of uh, points here. Um, the, the, it's, it's a tough question to answer because the expected luminosities of stripped stars depends heavily on their initial masses. And you expect this phenomenon of stripped stars to actually occur from basically all masses. So you can get very low mass stripped stars like we've been seeing here, 0 0.5 solar masses. But you, you also see eight solar mass stripped stars, they would be kind of here. They would have typical luminosities of 5.5 maybe, or five, and they look like all Freya stars. The stripped stars that were never observed and are expected to be very common are lying in the luminosity range of about 3.5 to five uh, solar luminosity, uh, 10 to the 3.5 to 10 to the five solar luminosities. Um, whether or not they're bright depends of course on the temperature. So I'm not sure right now whether you asked me about the luminosity or their brightness in the visual? Uh, the luminosity. Okay, so does that answer your question? Um, you said that it's, uh, it's difficult to predict, that's what I, I got from what you said. Well, it, it, depends on, it depends on the mass. You see, there is a cloud yeah. of stripped stars here, yeah. uh, and it really depends on the mass where they started. So the stripped star, the sort of stripped stars I was referring to in this talk are lying in this okay. regime. Okay. Uh, they started their lives as say eight to 20 solar mass star. Okay. And they end their lives between 1.5 and eight solar masses. And these guys have basically never, were basically never observed. Okay. And they're expected to be out there abundantly. 
Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, does anybody have any question? We have time for a couple of questions, if there's anyone else. Okay, if not, I, I have a question. Um, I think this is slide 32 or something where you um, showed the chi-squared plots. Yeah. For the second object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, maybe you explained it for the first source, but I missed it. Um, I can see at least in the first two plots how you're getting the, so it's the minimum, uh, the, where the chi-squared is a minimum, you have a value and then are you using the red line to get the uh, sort of the uncertainty? Is that what it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I guess in the third, uh, the plot on the extreme right, I guess it, the distribution is just very broad, so you're unable to get a... Yes. Okay. And uh, I also noticed that uh, in the first source, your chi-squares are actually very, very close to one in all three cases. But in this one, it looks like for the first... Uh, the extreme left one, it looks like the chi squares, the radius chi squares are much lower than one. Uh, what, yeah, what it's, it's, it's uh, you, you know, usually when we see lower chi squares, it means that your errors are overestimated. Yeah, right. um, to be honest, in this, in this, and it's kind of complicated because it's, um, it's a chi square that um, combines uh, about seven different uh, iron lines and also one oxygen line. They're in different parts of the spectrum. And this plot, I think, was actually just assuming a constant signal to noise across the spectrum. Okay. And it's very possible that you overestimate the error here. It's actually quite sloppy. I don't know why we ended up doing it like this. Of course, it wouldn't change anything except of the actual value. So I think for here, we just assumed the average signal to noise of these lines, but they actually are in very different parts of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. For example, so, uh, the red uh, part can be very noisy and so on. So when you say yeah. it's a combined chi-squared, in this case, you, you've done the simple thing of assuming they all have the same weightage, regardless of the second noise, but when you combine So, them. yeah, so in the paper, there is a lot done. We also show these plots. I don't know if we show the plots, but definitely the measurements for each individual line mm -hmm. and for line groups. So we tried both. So there are like 25, I think, lines we looked at, and each individual line gave you a measurement. Uh, here you see the actual measurements for line groups, uh, where indeed the helium one does not constrain it very well. And yeah, we did it like you just said. Okay, thanks. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Tomer again. <laughs>